morning. A warm welcome to all of you who are worshiping together in the Spirit of Hope United Church Sanctuary in Edmonton, and to those of you who are here virtually through the live online broadcast. For those here in person, please stay for a time of visiting and refreshments after church. You are welcome, whether this is your first time here or you have come before. We welcome each other and share fully in the life of the church regardless of age, ethnicity, gender identity, ability, sexual orientation, or economic circumstances. You are welcome as you are for who you are, equally loved and valued by God. My name is Karen A. Strope. I am a member of this congregation here at Spirit of Hope, and I do serve on the M&P committee here too. We will acknowledge the land now. We acknowledge that the land on which Spirit of Hope United Church sits was covered by Treaty 6 when it was signed in the 1870s, decades before this area was given the name Alberta. The territories of Treaty 6 are tra traditional meeting grounds, gathering places, and travel routes of many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. Today, we are grateful and honored to gather on Treaty 6 land. Those of you gathering in other places, please be mindful and grateful for the history and legacy of the First Peoples to know the land where you are. So at this time, if anyone has any announcements they would like to share, you can come forward now. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Vicki Wynn, and I'm the in-house coordinator for Jazz and Reflections, Judy Meinzer being the one who's doing the uh, heavy work of getting the word out. Uh, but we do have to have volunteers to help put the concerts on here. So this morning, the reason I was late was I sat down at my computer and I thought, oh, I better make up my sign-up chart, and I did. And the first page when it rolled out used up Thank goodness it's laser printer and not ink because it used up a whacking lot of black. It was all black. So I went back to old school with the ruler and the pen. Um, I do have a sign-up sheet. And I'm looking for volunteers. This is the first time we have done this. So this is a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants operation here, people. I have greeters, uh, the reflection, which is short. It's a humorous little story or uh, a little bit of a prayer. It is not more than two to three minutes. Uh, we need people to do the cafe at the interval. I need some bakers. I need a sound person. And I've put down setup because there will be a case where, depending on how many people are in the group or whatever, we might need to move some chairs. That's about as much of a job description as I have at this time. 
After the first week, I might be able to give you a more complete job description, but for, for now, that's what it is. So if you would like to sign up after the service downstairs, I will have the clipboard down there and I can answer any questions you might have, hopefully. Thank you. My name is Bev Moore. Um, we have a group here at the church called Breakfast Fellowship. They get together every second month for breakfast at a restaurant. This month, we're meeting on September 16th at a place called Tasty Tom's, which is on White Avenue, 29th Street. Um, it's going to be at 10 o'clock this month, only because Tasty Tom's opens at 10. Usually we meet at 9.30. If anyone has any questions about either getting together on September 16th or in November or the months bi-monthly after that, please contact me after church. Thank you. I know this announcement is in the spark, but this is for the people that like to get announcements orally so that they learn it. We are getting ready for Thanksgiving because it is really just around the corner. We're collecting canned goods and non-perishable foods for the food security program. Out in the lobby, I have a big wagon. I want that wagon full by Thanksgiving. So if anybody has any cans or rice or pasta, there's a list in the, in the bulletin, in the spark. And it's a good idea. If it says buy one, get one free, then buy the two. You might only use one, but one can come here. So thank you. So I'm sure you've noticed that the choir is back in action. Um, I just want to point out there is a small error in the order of service today. We are not going to be asking the Almighty for a lesson on Renaissance sculpture. It should be, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. <laughs> Not statues. Hello, I'm Jessica Moore. I'm Judy's partner in crime. And we are looking for volunteers for the upcoming barbecue. It's our second annual one. And last year was really successful. So we want it to be successful again. And we need your guys' help. So please talk to Judy or myself about signing up. Thank you. And yes, we need to promote everything so that we have bodies coming. And today, some people have volunteered to deliver the little flyers to mailboxes in the neighborhood. And I will make more when I find out kind of who's going to go where. So I have these, and there will be a sign-up sheet downstairs with Jessica and I. And Faye is helping as well to get people together to help. Thanks. Bye. That's it? That's all? <laughs> I figured that first Sunday after Labor Day, we'd spend 90% of the service just talking to each other. Let's begin our worship. Uh, by welcoming each other uh, with our eyes, with a wave, with a hello, uh, with our voices as we sing, and as uh, we light a candle and remind us that we always gather in the light and the peace of Christ. Let's begin our worship.
If you're over 90, under nine or in between, welcome one another. Welcome. If you're a regular here, reluctant, just visiting or not sure, welcome one another. Welcome. If you'd rather be golfing or camping or sleeping in, welcome one another. Welcome. There we go. <laughs> Let's pray. Ever loving God, we have gathered today side by side as faith hungry followers of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. A visual aid for today. A little bit of purple Play Doh. Right? I tried to make it as smooth as I could, but it still has some little bumps on it because I was trying to pound it flat with my hand. I suppose I could have used a rolling pin, but that didn't work. This is me. I don't know if you can see that, but there might be a little of an indent here. I don't know. So it doesn't matter whether I'm walking really softly. Even the soft ones left a little indent. Or if I'm being, uh, you know, as big and strong and heavy as I can. No matter how I do it, I leave my mark. Right? And I suppose I could even do this. No matter what we do, everything we do changes something. It could be a tiny little thing. I mean, if you think about it, you breathe in some air. Your body filters out some of the oxygen and it pulls it into your body and it combines with your cells and it, and it does that and your, it picks up some carbon because most of our body is it's got carbon in it, and, and when we breathe out, that oxygen and carbon come out as carbon dioxide, and we kind of probably rebreathe out all that nitrogen and other gases that we took in. And that changes things, because that carbon dioxide we breathe out gets used by other parts of our world. Plants especially use carbon dioxide, and they use it to help grow. And when they're done, they keep the carbon, and they let the oxygen go, which comes back to us. And so even a something really tiny, like just normal breathing, changes things. We have to really be careful about times that we make changes that make things really bad for others or for our world. You know, if I'm thinking about like the footprints I'm leaving, am I leaving the world where my footprints aren't making it horrible for someone else? Am I being too mean? Or am I just wrecking things? If I cut down all the trees, where is all that oxygen going to get, all that carbon dioxide going to get breathed up and turned back into oxygen? If I build highways and, and uh, apartment buildings or wherever a bit of good farmland, where am I going to get my food from? Right? It makes a difference. And it makes a real big difference when we think about just how do I treat someone else? How am I making their life better by what I do? So I'm kind of hoping that my footprints that I'm leaving in this world make it a better place rather than make it worse. Okay. Why don't you pray with me? I'll, I'll say a sentence and you can repeat it back. Thank you, God, Thank you, God for, all of the times for all the times I make a good difference. A good difference. Amen. We're going to sing together, and uh, after the song, uh, anybody who wants to be part of the church school today is more than welcome to take part in it. <laughs>
First reading this morning is from Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. If your sister or brother should commit some wrong against you, go and point out the error, but keep it between the two of you. If she or he listens to you, you have won a loved one back. If not, try again, but take one or two others with you, so that every case may stand on the word of two or three witnesses. If your sister or brother refuses to listen to them, refer the matter to the church. If she or he ignores even the church, then treat that sister or brother as you would a Gentile or tax collector. The truth is, whatever you declare bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you declare loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth join in agreement to pray for anything whatsoever, it will be granted you by my Abba God in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in their midst. The second reading is Romans 13, verses 8 to 10. Owe no debt to anyone except the debt that binds us to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you have fulfilled the law. The commandments... No committing adultery, no killing, no stealing, no coveting, and all the others are all summed up in this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love never wrongs anyone. Hence, love is the fulfillment of the law. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's pray. Wonderful God, we join on, on this day as we are beginning uh, a program life in the church and as students are heading to class, we are reminded of new beginnings that carry on from where we were. May we our reflections on old scriptures bring us new insight and challenge for this day. Amen. Now, you may have heard the disturbing news that broke uh, a little over a week ago that the Ashbourne Assisted Living Residence that's associated with Garneau United Church in the university area has been sold. It was in the news for a couple of days, but then People stop talking. The new owners of the building have decided that they're not going to continue to operate it as a assisted living facility moving forward, which means practically that all of the residents have until November 30th to move out. Here's, here's what I know. A number of years ago, in what was a cutting edge plan at the time, the Garneau United Church Congregation redeveloped their property to create seniors housing and included in their new building a chapel space on the main floor for the congregation to continue to operate as a church and really refocus their ministry on the, uh, the life and work of the seniors, particularly those who lived in the residence. And in recent years, though, the incorporated society that owns and operates that building has been challenged by only about a two thirds uh, the occupancy rate, which has been resulting in ongoing operating losses that simply aren't sustainable. And my understanding is that they did seek offers from companies that already run and operate assisted living facilities, but there were no serious takers. Even so, the, the buyer that they did find, they expected would continue to operate the facility as is for at least a while. And so they were surprised at the last minute that the new owners weren't going to wait and that necessitated that all of the residents be given eviction notices immediately. So as soon as it was, the sale was made public, the eviction notices went out. Now, a miserable consequence of assuming that the new owners would carry on for a bit is that the new residents were continuing to move in. I think even as recently as a week before the sale. Imagine being that person. People have asked me over the last week, how could the United Church of Canada let this happen? It's a good question. I asked the exact same question myself 
And I went to social media like any good, you know, public troller would do. <laughs> Unlike the process that, that the Spirit of Hope congregation followed when it was dealing with its surplus buildings, when it was doing an amalgamation, uh, the wider United Church of Canada did not have to approve the Ashbourne sale because administratively several years ago, the United Church had agreed to transfer the title of the property from the trustees of Garneau United Church to this arm length incorporated society that was set up to run the facility. But still, the United Church of Canada was aware that a sale was in the works because to help the Ashbourne and Garneau uh, make it through these times, the United Church of Canada gave them a significant loan so they could continue operating and hopefully have uh, time to sell while other funding alternatives are being sought. But like the society, the United Church of Canada was pretty much blindsided by the sudden need for eviction. Now, the logical part of my brain tells me that economic realities are understandable, and they are. Even the most worthwhile endeavors, be they churches, assisted living facilities, or anything, have to balance revenue and expenses if we are living within the economy of our community. And deficit financing, though through loans or through savings, can bridge caps, and it's certainly legitimate, but it's only possible for a while. Difficult decisions are understandable. But even amidst the understandable, the human realities and the consequences of those understandable circumstances are still extremely hard to hear and to accept. You know, getting an unexpected eviction notice is unnerving for any tenant, especially in a tight, high-cost rental market, but for the vulnerable residents of the Ashburn, many of whom have significant medical challenges, largely due to the natural progresses of long lives, this news is nothing short of devastatingly heartbreaking. <laughs> Now, the Ashbourne Society is committed to using proceeds from the sale to assist residents and staff as they transition. I, I don't know what the, the exact details, but I assume that means severance and moving costs or something like that, or, and certainly advice and, and assistance in that way. Spirit of Hope's Just and Caring Community Faith and Action Committee team and I are working on offering whatever support we can to our church members who reside at the Ashbourne. Now the Garneau United Church congregation remains part of the Northern Spirit region, as we are, and the new owners apparently are allowing them to continue to use the chapel for a while. I haven't seen anything official, but I heard they can have use of it for a couple of years. Obviously conversations about the future of that congregation will be happening, but nothing's decided yet. My particular term on the region's pastoral relations committee is gonna end in this December. So if something happens before then, I'll know right away because it'll have to go through our committee. Otherwise, the rumor mill is gonna to have to do its work and so I'll know like one minute later than I otherwise would. <laughs> Over this past week, I have heard lots of questions and even anger for what has transpired. And from what I've been able to figure out, I'm convinced that the Ashbourne Society Board, the Garneau Congregation, the United Church's Northern Spirit Region and General Council are deeply sad for how things have worked out. Believe me, no one is feeling good about this. And so I'm encouraging myself and others to let compassion be the main focus of our time. This theme of compassion in relation that we have with others runs right through both of our scripture readings today, both from Matthew and from Romans. Uh, the early Christian church in Rome, uh, Paul wrote of mutual love as being the top obligation that we would owe each other. Paul, like, like Jesus, points to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, as a verse that sums up all of the commandments in the Torah law. Love fulfills the law because honest, lived out love actually stands in the way of wrongs happening, wrongs that we might do to our neighbors. The gospel writer of Matthew uses a very simple teaching of Jesus, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there, to make that wider point 
of the value of compassionately resolving differences between people. Jesus and, and Matthew's author, author understood that even healthy and loving communities have conflict. In fact, healthy churches should want ideas and feelings to be expressed even if they are not always in total agreement. As I once learned in, in a course I took on, uh, on ministers who are able to engage in long length pastorates with churches, it's always essential to keep democracy alive. Keep those opinions coming in, challenge ourselves to be thinking about where we should be and what we might do. What's desired in compassionate communities is respectful sharing of differences and the willingness to seek resolution to differences that might lead to conflict, even if it's not my solution. The way Matthew words it is that it assumes that, that I'm in the right and that the other member of the church is the one who, uh, who needs to see the light. You can kind of hear that's how they wrote that passage. If another member of the church does you wrong, then you need to try and convince them to admit that. If not, get some witnesses to make sure that everybody can be assured that they've been confronted with their wrong. If that doesn't work, take it to everybody and we'll figure out what to do. And if they still won't do that, well, then treat them like a tax collector or a Gentile. More on that in a minute. I prefer to extrapolate that very focused example uh, to situations that maybe aren't quite as clear cut, where we know who's right and we know who's wrong. Uh, the passage that Matthew has there suggests that there's a process when I believe that I'm negatively affected by someone else's words or actions or maybe even inactions. First thing you do is you try and work it out between you in private, you know, kind of see if it's something that you can deal with on a one-to-one -one level. And then if that's not possible, maybe there's a small group that can help mediate the conflict. Now, I know that Matthew says you bring in those other people so you got witnesses so that everybody can know what's really happening. But I extrapolate to say, well, maybe a smaller group with people who aren't invested in the problem itself might be able to help. And then finally, if necessary, maybe the whole community needs to discern what needs to happen. In modern churches like the United Church of Canada, there are policies, there are procedures to deal with significant conflict in both informal and formal ways. Uh, my observations of the process is that they too encourage starting small, starting informally before engaging the formal process where someone's gonna have to write a report, you know, one of those kind of forms. Believe me, as a person who has uh, worked in this area of wider church work for several decades, that formal process is not something you want to just jump right into. It's not fun. And if you ever get to that formal process, don't try to make it up as you go along. <laughs> look, up, look up the handbook, figure out where the T's and the I's are and make sure you got the right process and don'ts. But sometimes the formal process is the best way to work toward the best possible resolution. And I've seen that work as well. In Matthew, if there's a conflict, settle it privately. If not, engage a couple of trusted witnesses, get into mediation. If not, engage the whole church. Maybe we need a formal hearing. And in the end, you may end up having to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector if a resolution cannot be agreed upon to some form of discipline. You know, maybe even exclusion to kind of be implying here in Matthew. Although the literary context of Matthew 18 is Jesus speaking to a group of, of Jewish followers. This is, uh, comes in a section of Matthew's gospel where Jesus is doing a whole series of teachings with his disciples. Uh, the, gospel author, author, the gospel author is clearly talking not just reporting what Jesus might have said to his Jewish followers 40 years earlier, the author is talking to the far more diverse group that is the early church 40 years after Jesus may have spoken to that group. And in both contexts, the worst case scenario is to exclude in some way, at, at the very least ostracize the offending member, put them on the edge. 
In our modern United Church context, sometimes when the facts warrant, ministers end up on what we call the discontinued service list. There's two versions of that. You can go on voluntarily, or you can be disciplined. We don't use that language, but basically it's kind of like the unordaining of an ordained minister. You can't function as a minister. And it's a little more rare, but even congregational members or even congregational uh, visitors or adherents, people active in churches, can have their church involvement curtailed by processes of discipline of the church. But I noticed something as I was sitting with this passage this week. It really got me thinking. You know, I read that passage literally. And Jesus is saying, if you ignore them, treat them as if you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, I'm quite sure that the gospel author is using Jesus' words to speak usually about exclusion or at worst or at best ostracization. But then I ask myself, myself, singular. What does Jesus say about how we're supposed to treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Well, how does Jesus talk about Gentiles, the non-Jewish, people from other faith traditions, other cultural traditions, people outside the inside group? Jesus told the Gentile woman who had asked for help for her sick daughter, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But after she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, then Jesus praised her for her faith and her daughter was healed. In Mark's narrative where that that happens, from that moment on, Jesus continues not to just travel through the Gentile territory, but to teach and to heal in both Gentile and Jewish communities moving forward. In Mark's gospel, You never, ever hear the language of, I'm only here for the lost sheep of Israel again, after that encounter with that Gentile woman. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the resurrected Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And the word behind nations is the same word used for Gentiles. What about tax collectors? Well, Jesus saw a man named Matthew or Levi, depending upon which book you're reading it from, sitting at the tax table, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Then at a dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. Treat them as a tax collector, like Matthew or Levi, or of course, you may be familiar with Luke 19, where Jesus says to the man up in the tree, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house tonight. The bigger picture here of Jesus, and certainly the Apostle Paul decades later, is an inclusion, not an exclusion, when we're talking about the Gentiles. And in Jesus' language about the tax collectors, it's about welcome, not ostracization. Not everybody, even the most pious in the community, agreed with what the attitude that Jesus had, but Jesus just didn't care. They complained about the company that Jesus kept around the dinner table. His disciples wanted the woman to be just shushed away. She's not in the group enough to warrant any of our ministry. Jesus didn't care. Healing and hope are always going to be appropriate. So with that in mind, listen to these words again. If your sibling should commit some wrong against you, go and point out the error but keep it between the two of you. If they listen to you, you want a loved one back. If not, take one or two others with you so that they may stand on the word of witnesses. If your sibling still does not listen, then take the matter and refer to the church. If they ignore even the church, then treat them as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. Does that sound different when we think about how Jesus said to treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Treat them as you would a Gentile or tax collector. In other words, treat them as someone worthy of healing in faith, 
and treat them as someone with the potential to find faithful paths to continue to walk. Now there may be some things we need to do in situations of conflict to protect the vulnerable, to ensure a safe and peaceful community, but we can treat even the most conflicted among us with respect and with hope. There's a very old Christian worship practice called the passing of the peace of Christ. Its traditional place within the worship services, within the liturgy, the order of service in the church, is just before sharing communion. And in practice, in many different denominations, passing the peace is when people turn to those who are sitting near them in the church and greet them with a welcoming handshake, with uh, words in the oldest traditions, with a kiss, and often would say something like, peace be with you. And what would the person respond? And also with you. Yeah, and then I would say, peace be with you. And you would respond back to me, and also with you, right. Symbolically and, and theologically, this act is proclaiming that in spite of anything that might be dividing us right now, around the welcome table of Jesus, we're gonna be one at peace. At least for that time, even if we finish the meal and go back to being in conflict. Now we do something similar here at Spirit of Hope. At the beginning of our service, maybe because we need to be at peace for the whole service, not just for time to share communion, the Christ candle is lit, and we sing together a gathering song. This month we're singing, The Spirit in Me Greets the Spirit in You. In the order of service, we're calling this, you know, welcoming each other, gathering in the light of Christ. Now, some of you may remember that in a time before COVID restriction protocols, we used to actually encourage people to literally reach out to others and welcome them to church. Some of us went all over the room passing the peace to the point that there were times when you were so enthusiastic sharing the peace of Christ that we had to gently and sometimes not so gently encourage you to please make your way back to your seat and stop being so peaceful. When I was in Minneapolis last May at the Festival of Homiletics, uh, during the opening worship, a thousand people in the room in this wonderful old church, uh, the passing of the peace came up. And people turned to their neighbors that were sitting near them and they put their hand out and we shook hands and we spoke words of peace and welcome. And, and I must admit, it threw me off a bit because I was out of practice. But I realized how much I missed that ritual. It's been three and a half years since we physically passed the peace in the act of worship. Your leadership team and I are, are, we talk about these kind of things every month. And we're not quite ready to lift that current protocol of having a non-touching practicing of passing of the peace. But we do review those few remaining protocols every meeting and we've made a number of adjustments over the last couple of years. I don't know where we're gonna go or when that might change, but personally, I do hope we're not going to abandon that ritual forever. When I was in Minneapolis, and I was like, whoa, we're actually going to touch each other. <laughs> After I got over that, it was like, I got something that I missed. And I, I know we're doing our best to try and recreate that in a, in a safe environment, but there's something about that ritual that I, maybe I can't. And regardless, though, of how we practically pass the peace during worship, I do hope that we continue to embrace the symbolic significance that that act embodies. That no matter what conflict or what difference there might be existing between us right now, when we gather as a community of faith, when we become this body of Christ, when the two or three or 50 or 60 of us come together, we're willing to set aside those things for a Let's let the compassion shown to us in Jesus be a source of that peace. Jesus reached out to the Gentile and the tax collector. Even though in some contexts they say, well, that means that you're setting them aside and have nothing to do with them anymore. The truth is, 
like the footprints in the Plato. Peace, peace can be extremely impactful. It can be contagious. And as we live it out within these physical and these virtual walls as a church, we're going to find it more natural to be peacemakers in other parts of our lives. Because what we practice here is a model for what we practice there. And then we're going to find it more natural to be peacemakers all throughout our lives. And the world that we share is going to benefit. In the end, I think that's exactly what our two scripture readings are hoping for us today. Peace be with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. And also with you. Amen. join together in prayer. Wonderful God, we are all made in your image. You call your creation very good. And even when we take that good creation and we create pockets of disharmony, when we treat each other with disrespect, even with anger and violence, there is still the goodness that binds us together. We will keep each other safe. And there will be times when we need to separate when it's appropriate for some form of curtailing or discipline. But let us never, God, forget the goodness that binds us. And that even the most disagreeable one among us is a sibling in Christ one worthy of compassion and love for who they are at this point. We pray, God, for the courage to find that goodness, even if that's all that we're able to find in the moment. We pray special prayers, God, for the residents of the Ashbourne Assisted Living Facility as they work with family members and staff to transition to new housing. We know it will be stressful. We think particularly, God, of those whose, whose memory is not as sharp as it once was. 
We pray for those with Alzheimer's and dementia, and those with significant physical ailments, where this move will be confusing and very hard. We pray, God, that compassion will accompany all who assist in this process. We pray, God, for the people of, of Morocco as they deal with devastating her, uh, earthquake and how the, the wonder of that city that was, that was damaged and its, its ancient architecture and its eyes to the history also means that it's particularly susceptible for these kind of events. And there are thousands of God who are no longer in other people's lives. We pray God for the people of Ukraine and Russia who were embattled in war. We pray God that hard hearts bent on violence and destruction and imperialism be softened with the compassion that says we can be good neighbors. We can be respectful neighbors, even if we have a distance, that there can be peace. All this we pray, God, in Jesus' name, who taught us so many wonderful things, but particularly that to sum up how we treat each other in all of the law is simply to say, love your neighbor as yourself. God, we pray modern words of Jesus' old prayer. Creator in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom power and glory in our world, now and forever. Amen. There are so many ways that we assist each other and support each other in the ministry that we hold together that none of us could do uh, all on our own. Uh, as we take time to share some financial offerings for the church today, you're reminded that there are lots of ways uh, to do that and that we also honor all of the gifts of prayer, of talent, and time as well. Tuition assistance. Have you wants to become a doctor someday? As the oldest son, this young teenager dreams big amidst the daily struggles that he and his family face. Hamden's family came to Lebanon several years ago to escape the war in Syria. They can barely afford their monthly rent, food, household expenses, clothing, and medical needs. While his father works in a produce shop, his mother stays at home to care for the family's four children and two other family members. This family of eight lives on the father's pay and a small income supplement they receive from the UN. Like Hamden, many children in Lebanon are at risk of losing their education because of economic crisis, intensified by the COVID pandemic and the devastating 2020 explosion in Beirut, has plunged their families into poverty. When parents can't pay school tuition, children face an unstable future. The Middle East Council of Churches, MECC, assists Lebanese students and Syrian refugees ages 8 to 13 with tuition and fees to secure their education and prevent them from becoming a lost generation. One thing Hamlin's parents don't have to worry about anymore is his education. With tuition assistance provided by MECC to Hamlin and his siblings, they can continue to study until graduation and gain entrance into a university, giving Hamden a chance to achieve his dream. Your support through mission and service helps remove barriers for teenagers like Hamden so they can work together toward their dreams. Thank you.
gifts, we seek to be more like Jesus. Challenging, compassionate, community changing. Amen. Christ be with you. And also be with you. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>